Hi, I'm Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts. The discovery of seafloor spreading closed the case, and it made it clear that plate tectonics was happening. A lot of work has happened since then, and we've developed a sophisticated view of the interior of the Earth based upon research into what the crustal plates are like and what the mantle is like below. So this diagram shows in schematic form where the various layers of the Earth are and what their role is with regard to tectonics. We'll get into a lot of the individual plate interaction types, but give you the overall picture right now of how the Earth is layered, and this will allow tectonics to make more sense. In terms of the solid Earth layers, the Earth is crusted over with two major kinds of crust, oceanic crust and continental crust. Ocean crust is thin. It's only about 5 to 10 kilometers thick, and it seems to be produced at these seafloor spreading centers, being made up of dense magnesium iron silicates, such as minerals olivine, pyroxene, ilmenite, and feldspars that are rich in calcium, along with minor minerals like magnetite. In comparison, the continental crust, here illuminated to show the difference between it and the oceanic crust, and I've vertically exaggerated the thickness of slightly, just so it'll be more clear visually. The Earth's continents, however, are deeper than the oceanic crust. They're thicker. Continental crust can be anywhere from 10 to 50 or so kilometers thick, and it's made of lighter silicates than ocean crust. It's less dense. It's actually buoyant, so it doesn't plow through the ocean crust as continents move. It actually rides along with them, but they can also ride underneath the continents because they're denser. If, they, if two plates converge an oceanic plate and a continental plate, the oceanic plate will diverge under the continental plate. It's called subduction, and I'll get back to that. What allows the plates, the oceanic crust and the continental crust, to move laterally is a layer we define not by its chemical composition, but more by its properties, the asthenosphere. The asthenosphere is a layer where rock is partially molten. It's hot from coming up from below, but the pressure is relieved near the surface enough that it can start to partially melt. Deeper in the mantle, you don't get melt because the rock is under too much pressure. The asthenosphere is where per partial melting occurs, and it allows the crustal plates above to move relative to the asthenosphere, to slide on top of it. The asthenosphere essentially lubricates the motion of the plates above it, which we call the lithosphere. The lithosphere is made up of the ocean crust, the continental crust, and a very small amount of the mantle just beneath the ocean crust and, and the continents. It is not, like I said, uh, a chemical designation. Lithosphere, asthenosphere are based on the physical properties of the rock because of their temperature and pressure. The lithosphere rocks are not hot enough to melt, typically, and those plates behave more brittle. The rock is not under a lot of pressure. It behaves like rock. It's, it's brittle, it breaks, it's rigid. You go down to the asthenosphere and the rock behaves more like a plaster and it's partially molten, and so you, the lithospheric plates move along on top of the asthenosphere. The asthenosphere is within the mantle, uh, but it's not chemically distinct from the rest of the mantle. It's just where the physical properties optimize to create this, this sheen layer of partial melt where the lithosphere can move above it. What appears to drive the motions of the plates themselves is complicated and not fully understood, but the major parts of the story seem to be that the mantle is convecting below the lithosphere. And this mantle convection, the movement of the rock, it's not molten, but it's under intense pressure. While hot, the rock is solid, not quite like taffy. It's more solid than that, but it does move and plastically deform over time. And so convecting rock in the mantle appears to drive by its motion the crust laying on top of it to just move along in the same direction by, by friction. And so the plates move along in response to mantle convection currents. It's a bit more complicated than that because it does appear to be when an ocean crust plate subducts under a continental plate, gravity will start pulling it. And so one of the reasons that the divergent plate boundaries of, of a mid-ocean ridge, the plates diverge is Partially they're being shoved aside by the new crust, and partially they're being dragged by gravity. And as you remember, deep within the Earth, inside the mantle is the core. The outer core is liquid and flows, and this is why we have a magnetic field in the first place. The inner core is solid within. It's hotter, but the pressures are greater, and so it remains into a solid state. If it weren't for the existence of a solid inner core in to be in contact with a liquid outer core, we wouldn't have the geodynamo we have. 
At mid-ocean ridges, seafloor spreading is a kind of divergent plate boundary motion. Plates, logically, can move relative to each other horizontally in only a certain number of ways. They can diverge from each other. They can converge, plates slamming into each other. Or they could just move laterally. They can scrape past each other along the side. All of these happen on Earth. Every kind of plate motion that can happen does. And it's all driven by mantle heat flow, mantle convection, and then the properties of the rigid lithosphere above the asthenosphere. Is it ocean crust? Is it continental crust? How do they behave relative to each other? And we'll talk about each type. Across the planet, we don't see the mid-ocean ridges because they're at the bottom of the ocean, obviously. There is one place, however, where you can look directly at the mid-ocean ridge in air, and that's Iceland. The island nation of Iceland is part of the mid-Atlantic ridge where an extra mantle heat plume from below, probably from the core mantle boundary, is providing extra heat to that particular spot along the mid-Atlantic ridge. And so you get more volcanism there, enough to raise that mountain up to be a very large shield volcano that breaches the waves and becomes a landmass. Iceland is very geologically active. Underneath the island nation, there is the mid-Atlantic ridge, which is producing new crust constantly, including on the island of Iceland itself. This is fed from rising magma from the mantle heat plume, the heat plume beneath, and the hot spot of extra heat that is focused on the island itself. That's why the island has built itself up there. On Iceland, you can see volcanoes erupting. They're right there. But it bears remembering that the activity at, at Iceland is the same activity you get along the entire mid-ocean ridge. Until recently, in fact, it was not possible to view directly these eruptions. Uh, this footage here shows from deep sea exploration from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. A volcano, a deep sea mid-ocean ridge volcano actually erupting in place. This is down at the mid-ocean ridge. Similarly, in this footage, you have a mid-ocean ridge volcanic eruption going on. These are difficult missions to carry out because obviously you're right next to a volcano. I think this is an ROV, a remotely operated vehicle, but nonetheless, you get the sense of the violence of one of these erupting. On the surface of Iceland, it's more like this. This is what you're used to seeing, but this is a lava flow. This lava is flowing fairly slowly because it's being pushed by lava coming up from below behind it but it doesn't move very quickly. This is analogous to what you would see if you were down at the mid-ocean ridges watching new crust form. It's going to slowly roll out into the ocean water, pushing the rock already there aside. Geology in Iceland is spectacular. I've been there myself, and I recommend anyone to go see this. This is at Thingvellir in Iceland. You're looking at the actual mid-ocean ridge rift along the ridge axis right here. On the left, I don't know which direction this diver is facing, but let's, let's say he's facing south. If he's facing south, on our left, looking at the picture, is the North American Oceanic Plate. On the right is the Eurasian Oceanic Plate. You are literally looking at a boundary between two distinct crustal lithospheric plates, and you can touch either side. That particular part of the rift is inactive now, obviously, and that's why you can have water filling it. Other parts of Iceland are quite geologically active, and volcanoes go off there all the time. Another thing associated with these uh, seafloor spreading centers, these mid-ocean mid ridges, are hydrothermal vents. The distribution of hydrothermal vents across the world's mid-ocean ridges is pretty ubiquitous. They're found throughout the world, and these are areas where heat is driving the water that saturates the ocean floor. Heat from those volcanoes is driving that water to, to be heated upwards and to erupt as basically a geyser on the ocean floor. And as they erupt, they produce these chimneys from minerals dissolved from the rock by the, the hot water, exiting into cold ocean water and precipitating out, basically, and building up into these uh, marvelous structures, which are also uh, oases for life, as I'll, as I'll talk about in a different part of this course. Now, if you're looking at that map, and you're looking at the mid-ocean ridges. The youngest material is along the ridge axis. It gets older as you go away. But if you look at the scale of time on this map, the oldest ocean crust anywhere in the world is about 280 million years. And there's not much of that. Well, it turns out it's because ocean crust 
is formed in mid-ocean ridges and it's destroyed at subduction zones. Where an ocean plate runs up against a continental crust, a piece of the continental lithosphere, continental plates are less dense than ocean plates. The rock is more like granite and less like basalt. It's less heavy. And so the ocean lithosphere, the ocean crust, will dive under the continent as they move in a convergent plate boundary. The ocean crust will be forced under the continent because it's denser and the continent simply rides on top of it. As it does so, as it moves, the ocean crust is pushed further and further into the mantle until it reaches temperatures where it begins to crack and break and melt. And this generates magma that rises to form subduction-related volcanoes, mountain chains formed from subduction-related volcanism. Examples are found throughout the world. In the Philippines, for example, here you see the oceanic crust diving under the continental lithosphere. And as it does, it's being heated up and volcanoes are rising directly above where the ocean crust is breaking apart and melting down below. Wherever you get a subduction zone, you get deep earthquakes from that ocean crust breaking up as it goes back into the mantle. You get volcanoes and you get subduction-related mountain chains like the Andes. The Andes are subduction-related volcanic mountains. That's all rising up because directly below those mountain peaks, the ocean crust is subducting below the continent and it's breaking apart and melting, feeding magma chambers that erupt granitic magma to form mountains, to, to form volcanoes. The Aleutian Islands along the northern edge of the Pacific Plate are all subduction-related volcanic islands. Every one of those is a volcano that's risen up to form land. As the volcanoes erupt, they grow islands, and what you're seeing there is the margin of the Pacific Plate going under the continental crust, the North American plate, that dark area is a trench. Trenches form as a result of the ocean crust bending down as it goes under the leading edge of the continental plate. And so you get a deep trench that is literally where the ocean crust is falling due to gravity back down into the mantle, grinding as it goes, snapping and cracking, producing powerful, deep earthquakes. The island nation of Japan is entirely built of subduction-related volcanic mountains and rock. The entire island is built out of volcanoes, and the subduction is still going on there. Off to the right, you see where the Pacific Plate is subducting underneath the continental crust, and you're forming a chain of islands along that subduction zone boundary, and a deep trench just offshore from Japan. Japan has to deal with a lot of earthquakes constantly because it is an active zone of subduction. Mount Fuji, the iconic mountain of Japan, is itself an active volcano produced by subduction of the ocean crust down below it. Under your feet, miles below you, the ocean crust there is melting and feeding the formation of mountains. Where you have a subduction zone, you can have subduction-related volcanoes, earthquakes, and a trench. And in fact, the deepest points on Earth's surface are the trenches. Famously, the deepest point on Earth is within Challenger Deep inside the Mariana Trench, the deepest place on Earth's surface. At 36,000 feet, or about 11,000 meters, it's actually deeper than Mount Everest is tall. So ocean crust operates by forming at mid-ocean ridges. Seafloor spreads apart there. It records the history of magnetic reversals as the new crust is forming. And the crust moves away on either side. Old ocean crust is destroyed by subduction, where you have these deep trenches and powerful earthquakes. 